Good morning. It's really good to be with you again as we continue to study the book of James together. We're going to be in James chapter 3, verses 1 to 18, and oh, verses 13 to 18. And again, it's really dealing with the whole subject of wisdom. We touched on that briefly in chapter 1 and verse 5, where it said, If anyone lacks wisdom, let them ask God who gives generously. We're going to read that passage, and I believe that it's an important passage, and then I'm going to pray, and then we're going to consider God's word. So, reading from God's word, chapter 3 and verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor but he envy, Selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit impartial and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. We're going to pray together. Father in heaven, we come to you this day, thanking you again for your word. We are conscious, Lord, that we need your word and we need wisdom. And we want to pray that you would impart to us today a spirit of wisdom and revelation, that, O oh God, you would speak into our lives, open our eyes to your truth, open the eyes of our heart to embrace your truth, make us wise. God, just in a wonderful way, we pray for an encounter with you. Lord, equip us, teach us, we pray. Hear us, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Right, well, it's really good to be able to consider God's word together, and that's what I want us to do today. If all else fails, read the instructions. It's very interesting. I was thinking about this passage, talking with some folk, and last night I actually dreamed about this passage and the importance of this passage, and it really was just impressed upon me again the importance of wisdom. And again, I want us to think about that because I believe that this was a prompting from the Lord. So James starts with a question. Who is wise and understanding among you? Now, wisdom can be mistaken for many things. We can mistake it for knowledge, in learning, tradition, and even gray hair. Some of the cleverest people I know are not wise, and we often speak about the clever fool. But Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 7 tells us, Wisdom is supreme, therefore get wisdom. So wisdom is not just an issue of what you are saying with your mouth, but rather wisdom relates to what you are and what you do. That's what James is telling us. He's a practical man. Now we need to distinguish between what I call general godly wisdom and a word of wisdom and knowledge that God gives. Wisdom and knowledge are a spiritual gift that we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 8. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. Now I will say more about that a little later on. But in verse 13, James is saying, let him show wisdom by his good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. So he's clearly saying to us that wisdom is really knowing and doing. Okay, knowing is doing in the Christian life. Now, I want you to think about this situation for a moment. Your son comes to you and says, Dad, I want a bicycle. So you say, great, we'll get you one. And the first mistake you make is you go to a catalogue and you order one. The box arrives and it's like a box of scrap metal. It's full of nuts, bolts, bars and pieces. And you look at this and in your brilliance, you read the instructions, and then you start. Connect AA to BB, connect C to D, 
And then you get totally confused. So you hit on a great idea. Read the instructions again. So you read them over and over and over. And eventually what's happening is Johnny is becoming a little agitated. When's the bike coming? And you say to him, listen, my boy, I am now an expert on bicycle assembly. And let me tell you about this bike. There are 97 moving parts on it. The tires are made of biodegradable, recyclable material. The saddle is made from renewable resources. This is an amazing bike. It's got disc brakes. What more could you want? And he's not really interested in this. He's saying, Dad, I want action. Put it together. That's what I want. And in the Christian life, there are a lot of people who claim to know the instructions. In fact, they tell me, I've read the manual, I know the Bible. But I am convinced that there are lots of people who claim to know the Bible, love the Bible, having read the Bible, but they're afraid of the Bible. They're afraid to put it into practice. The Christian life is knowing and putting into practice. I mean, think of something practical. You read in the Bible, God says, tithe, give me a tenth of your income. Oh, I can't afford to do that. You're afraid of the Bible. God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13 and 14, eagerly desire the greater gifts to prophesy, to speak in tongues. It's in, it's in fact an imperative. We're afraid to pursue that. We're afraid of the Bible. Now, wisdom is knowledge in action. Wisdom is knowledge in action, putting the word of God into practice. Now, in James chapter 3 and verse 1, we read about those who were teachers. Many wanted to teach. Now, the key to teaching is to put knowledge into practice. That's the important thing. That is true wisdom. Now, it's interesting in the Old Testament, there was no word that was used for the word religion. Whenever the people wrote about religion, they wrote about the fear of the Lord. And Proverbs reminds us, that the fear of the Lord is actually the beginning of wisdom. In simple terms, your relationship with God is the start of your journey to becoming wise and to wisdom. Now, we're told by James there are two types of wisdom, okay? And in fact, there are two origins of wisdom as well. So listen to this. We read again here in verse 15 and in verse 17 of the passage. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly and spiritual and of the devil. But the wisdom that comes down from heaven. So what he is saying is we have heavenly wisdom and we have human wisdom. One is from God and the other is not. Now the problem with human wisdom is that it works in the short term, but the long term consequences of our human wisdom often proves to be fatal. Verse 15, listen to it again. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly and spiritual and of the devil. Now, these words speak about the origin of our human wisdom. I want you to think about this for a moment. As Christ followers, we have three deadly enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Now, when you look at this verse, the earthly is the world, the unspiritual, the natural is the flesh, and the devil, of course, he speaks for himself. We know all about it. So enemy number one that we have is the earthly or the world. And you see, there is a wisdom that comes from the world. It's a human wisdom, relates often to learning, if nothing more. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse and, and verses 20 and 21, we read these words. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. And he says, God was pleased through the, through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. So there is a wisdom that comes from the world, quite clear. And again, I think so often we confuse knowledge with wisdom. 
Now, we live in an age of information overload. I mean, we are bombarded all the time with new information. Now, there are many benefits from the learning of people and information. I mean, in terms of medicine, media, communication, travel. But knowledge is not wisdom. And we have experts, and they are producing reams and reams of information. And lots of that information is contrary to the Word of God and the practices we find in the Word of God. Now, I don't want to go into these issues in any detail. But, you know, there are people telling me that you can actually choose your gender. Now, I'm not an expert, but I do know that X and Y chromosomes cannot be changed by an act of will or something happening in my head. And we're told that children's rights are good and important, and they are. But I wonder, what about the rights of parents and of teachers? Protesters have the fundamental right, we're told, in democracy to demonstrate. Great, and I agree. But do law enforcement officers also have rights? We live in a world where, you know, we've got to think these issues through. What do we as Christians do? Do we obey God or do we obey the expert? It's a, the question we are faced with often. Well, in Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2, we read, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or the ungodly. He delights in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Now we face a challenge. Do we sit with the experts in judgment on God and his word and follow humanistic philosophy and wisdom? 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 21 says, The world through its wisdom did not know God. Now the world is simply society without God. Society living with no reference to God. It rejects God. It rejects his word. And so we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. We're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 4, that the man without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God. They're foolishness to him. They are spiritually discerned. He cannot understand them. Now, human wisdom is based on ever-changing human reason. And it's based on faulty and, if you like, fluctuating assumptions and ideas. Because every day, another expert comes up with another idea. And I want to say this to you, that God's wisdom is imparted by revelation. In other words, God has spoken and revealed himself in his word. We have it here. God speaks through revelation. So we have that. Human wisdom is in a continual state of flux. It's up and down all the time. God's word is a living and enduring word, a word we need to know. But our second enemy basically is the flesh, the unspiritual, the natural. Most of our lives are lived in the natural rather than in the spiritual. You see, most modern translations of the Bible translate a little word flesh, and they translate it really basically the sinful nature. And false wisdom always basically is attractive to our sinful nature, to our flesh. In other words, human wisdom is attractive to the senses, not the soul. It appeals to our hearing, our smell, our taste, our sight, all of these things, our touch. We live in a sensual society. We're always wanting to gratify our desires and our wants. We're told in the book of Jude, Jude, who was the brother of our Lord Jesus, he wrote, these men who divide you follow mere natural or sensual instincts. They do not have the spirit. You see, life is not about gratifying your desires, your wants, your greeds. And we have a clash of kingdoms. We have a clash of value systems, don't we? You know, you struggle between your new nature and what is deeply ingrained from your old way of life. 
and you're in conflict with those around you who haven't experienced Jesus. So listen again to those words of 1 Corinthians 2.14. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The prophet Isaiah, writing in chapter 11 and verse 2 of his book, tells us the Holy Spirit is the spirit of wisdom and understanding. When you have the Spirit of God, there's wisdom and understanding. You see, you as a Christian should, in a sense, begin to feel out of step with the world. You're a bit like a fish swimming against the stream all the time. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1 reminds us that we are aliens and strangers in this world. Our third enemy, we are reminded, is the devil. And there is a wisdom that comes from the devil. Now what we need to understand about the devil is that he comes with counterfeit wisdom. And that counterfeit wisdom that he has often bears resemblance to the real thing. Now, he doesn't come with blatantly outrageous ideas. He's a liar. Back in Genesis 3, Satan deceives Eve and Adam in the garden. They succumbed to his wisdom, and God had given them his word. He said to them in Genesis 2.17, You must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There was his word. But what they did was, they moved from God's word to human reason. And there they were, thinking, oh, we know what's good. What harm can a bit of fruit do? What harm can a bit of fruit do? And it was a move, if you like, from revelation, what God had said in his word, to their human reason. And what they did was, they moved, yeah, revelation to their reason. And I want to say to you, Satan is alive and well on planet Earth, deceiving people as he did in the garden. And his native language is lies. He's feeding you lies all the time. He lied to Eve. He said to Eve, you will be like God. The promise, I'll make you worldly wise. And you believe his lies, and boom, he destroys you. But notice the contrast in verse 17. The wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, good fruit, impartial and sincere. You see, Christian wisdom is not a philosophy or a theory. God is the author and the source of our wisdom. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 24 tells us, To those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. In, Revela in Ephesians 1 and verse 17, we read that the Holy Spirit of God is the spirit of wisdom and revelation. God gives you wisdom and God reveals himself to you. Satan is the great pretender. He's the expert counterfeiter. He will always come to you with forgeries. And the wisdom he gives is so often plausible. He caters for your senses, not your soul. Ladies, imagine, you know, you're getting engaged and along comes your fiancé and he's got you a two-carat diamond ring for the engagement. And then you find out later, it's a cubic zirconia. How would you feel? Now, cubic zirconias, interestingly enough, are manufactured by imitating the process that diamonds go through, but in a vastly speeded up way. They look good, but they're not the real thing. If you compare the value of a cubic zirconia with a diamond, there is no comparison. And so it is with wisdom. Counterfeit wisdom sounds good, but will bring total disaster. So what are the results of these two wisdoms? Well, the difference is really like chalk and cheese. Listen to verse 14 to 16. But if you harbor bitter envy, selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. 
such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and of the devil. Of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. He talks about bitter envy in verse 14. It talks about our motive. Think about this. You see, the heart of humanity's problem is the human heart. The word envy relates to the word jealousy, and the word bitter actually means to cut or to prick. And he's talking about a jealousy that cuts. It can't stand someone else succeeding. There's the desire to humiliate and degrade others. You can't stand or rejoice with other people in their success and their selfish ambition. It's an interesting word, literally meaning rivalry or party spirit. This word selfish ambition was actually used of a politician going around canvassing to get votes. Vote for me. That's what he's saying. And basically it is a spirit, if you like, of self-seeking. And it creates rivalry and division in the church. You can't do that. The people who want position and the motivation is selfish ambition, nothing else. He talks about boasting. Now pride always causes boasting. There's nothing more arrogant than the proud human wisdom that is around us. You've only got to watch debates or listen to Richard Dawkins, the atheist, on television. There's an arrogance about him. He knows without a doubt there is no God. He claims to be everywhere present, all-knowing, all-wise. When you listen to the so-called experts, they're defiant in their aggression towards God. And you see, human wisdom denies the truth. There's a sequence. You have bitter envy, selfish ambition, party spirit, looking for votes, boasting, and it slips into a denial of the truth. Worldly wisdom offers you nothing but empty promises, and it's totally opposed to the truth of God. Verse 17 also talks about the evidences there are for God's wisdom. The wisdom that comes down from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Now, in chapter 1 and verse 5, we read, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. God, the generous giver. So, wisdom is a gift from God. And when you come to faith in Christ's conversion, you are awakened and suddenly you are spiritually perceptive and you begin to grow in wisdom as you're open to the leading of the Spirit of God. But I want to for a moment say to you, we need to learn to distinguish between general godly wisdom that we derive from the Word of God and the experience of life and a word of wisdom and knowledge that we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 8, which is a spiritual gift. Now let me read those words to you again. He says, to the one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge, by means of the same Spirit. In the book of Acts chapter 5, there are a couple called Ananias and Sapphira. They're wanting to make out that they're the big generous givers and they're wanting prominence in the church. They sell a property... They come to Peter, they say, we sold the property, here's all the proceeds. Peter says to Ananias, why have you lied to God? Ananias is struck down. A few hours later, his wife arrives. He says to tell me, is this what you, is this what you did? Yes, yes, no, we sold it all, gave it to the church. God strikes it down. How did Peter know? He was given a word of wisdom and knowledge. He knew what they were doing. You see, this gift often reveals hidden truth about a person and it helps, it gives you the ability to articulate life-changing insights into a situation. It helps you to understand people's um, personal circumstances. So it brings insight, it brings knowledge, helps you to articulate these insights and basically 
we can say that it's revelatory. Now, I've shared this before, but I'll do it again. I was asked to see a lady. I never see ladies by myself, so I asked my daughter if she would be available just to be around when I saw this particular individual. My daughter said to me before she arrived, you know what, that lady is having an affair. I said, okay. And she said she's having an affair with Mr. So-and-so. The lady came and we sat down and we began to speak. And then she confessed to me that she'd been unfaithful to her husband. And I said to her, are you seeing Mr. So-and-so? Well, you can imagine she nearly fell through the floor. And God had revealed with a word of wisdom and knowledge who she was actually having this affair with. And you see, God works like that in amazing ways. And we must be open to what God is saying to us. Now, what are the evidences then of wisdom? Well, there's humility. Humility means power under control. That word humility was used to describe a stallion that had been broken in. Power under control. Humility is something that the moment you think you've got it, you've lost it. Happens all the time. I heard of the Duke of Wellington. One day he went to the communion rail and he knelt down. And as he was there, a poor man knelt next to him. And someone tapped the poor man on the shoulder and said, move away from the Duke. Wellington grabbed him by the hand and said, no, no, you stay here. He said, we are all equal here. You see, that's humility. We're all equal here. Now, God's wisdom is pure. And purity is ultimately an inward experience to start with, is it not? And basically, Matthew 5, verse 8, we have Jesus saying, Blessed are the pure in heart. And he's talking there about someone who has an undivided heart, a singleness of purpose in wanting to serve the Lord. So we read in Psalm 86 and verse 11, Lord, unite my heart to fear your name. Lord, give me an undivided heart. And you see, conversion, when you put your faith in Christ, it's like you've got this tension where you've got trying to go two ways, and this divided heart is now brought together, and your heart is united in a singleness of purpose as you want to follow and serve the Lord Jesus. God's wisdom is peace-loving, we are told. It doesn't mean peace at any price. It's not spineless, no, not at all. Peace lovers who are caring enough to confront for the well-being of others. And God's wisdom makes you considerate. It makes allowances for others. There's reasonable moderation with compromise in situations. It's submissive. It's willing to yield to reason. It's not demanding my rights, but rather submissive to the word of God. It's full of mercy. Yet for me, mercy means being willing to be inconvenienced for the sake of others. It produces good fruit. Good fruit. Wisdom brings good fruit. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. So we are to do the good works. Wisdom is impartial. It has absolutely no favorites. So James chapter 2 and verse 1, he says, My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, he says, don't show favoritism. And you see, favoritism and prejudice are indicative of a lack of wisdom. <clears throat> wisdom is sincere. It's without hypocrisy. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 12, we have conducted ourselves in holiness and a sincerity, a humility that comes from God. Now, the more you know of God's word and the more you put God's word into practice, the more these qualities are going to be evidenced in your life. So, what is the final outcome? Well, look at verse 16. Where you have envy, where you have selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. You see, human wisdom produces trouble and disorder and confusion all the time. But the outcome of God's wisdom, heavenly wisdom, we are told, is peacemakers who sow in peace and they raise a harvest of righteousness. 
Abraham reflects wisdom as we read about him in the book of Genesis. He followed God's directions. He experienced the blessing of God. He had a nephew, Lot, who was with him. But Lot, following human reason, saw a city called Sodom. And he said, that's it, that's where I'm going. That's where the action is. And he went there. He destroyed his family. His wife lost her life. And they were involved in the most dreadful situation because he followed human wisdom. So, life is about choices. And we need to wise up. We need to wise up. So, what about your personal response today? I heard a lovely story. There were two ducks and a frog. They shared a pond. And then a drought came. And the pond was getting increasingly you know, smaller all the time. It was just you know, diminishing in size. So the ducks were concerned about their friend, Mr. Frog. So they had a consultation. And they agreed that they'd get a stick. And one duck would take each side of the stick. The frog would take the middle piece with its mouth. And they'd fly off to a new pond where they could all basically live together with lots of water. Well, there they were. They took off on the day and they were flying. And while they were airborne, they flew over a farm. And the farmer saw these two ducks, the stick and the frog holding on. And he was quite amazed. And he said, I wonder who thought of that. And the frog said, I did. Oh, yes. Let him who flies take heed lest he crash. Let him show it. You see, the frog's mistake was, pride said, take the credit. Do things in humility that come from wisdom. So can I ask you, what motivates you? Selfish ambition? That insidious, envious jealousy? The desire to get the vote? Or to do God's will? Are you one of those people Every time someone gets a promotion, every time something goes well for someone else, it just eats away at you. That's worldly wisdom. See, as people look at you, what characterizes your life? You see, this is important. Pride, dishonesty, or purity and peace. Consideration, submission, mercy, good fruit, impartiality, sincerity. Is that what they see? See, where do you derive your wisdom from? Do you derive wisdom from self? That doesn't really help. Do you derive your wisdom from Satan? Listening there all the time to his lies. Or do you derive your wisdom from God and his words? Let me say to you again, you want to be wise. You need to read this. You need to wise up. Hear what God's saying to you. How would you describe your life as you follow Christ? Is there disorder, confusion, or is there that peace, that righteousness? You know, life is all about the choices you take and how you act on them. You see, when all else fails, you've got to read the instructions. When all else fails, you've got to read the instructions. I don't know what God is saying to you this morning. I don't know how the Spirit of God is ministering into your life. But maybe you realize that you know, you're so caught up with worldly wisdom. The psalmist says the blessed man, the blessed woman, are not those who walk in the way of the ungodly, stand in the way of the ungodly, or sit with them. But their delight is in the law of the Lord. They meditate on his law day and night. They're like a tree planted by streams. They grow, they flourish, they are blessed. I wonder what God is saying to you this morning. I wonder if God is not just speaking into your life. I just believe as I've gone through this passage and as I've thought about this passage, I know that, you know, again, I have felt very strongly prompted to say to you, wisdom is so important. Are you living a wise life? Are you honouring God? Are you? 
I want us to pray for a moment. I want you just to open yourself to the prompting of God, the prompting of his spirit. There's a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Maybe God is revealing to you some deep spots in your soul that you need to deal with, that you need to cry out to him to, to work in your life, to make you wise. Let's pray for a moment. Father, I just pray that in your grace and goodness, you would just come and work in all of us, Lord, who are under this word at this moment in time. Lord, I just sense that you want people to you know, come before you and with an open heart. Lord, I want to pray that you would, in your great grace, answer that prayer in James 1.5. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously. Lord, you're a generous God. Won't you just open our eyes? Won't you make us wise that we would honor you? Lord, you make wise the simple, your word says. And we come to you asking again that you would work in us. Lord, by your spirit, energize us to be all that you've called us to be. We come praying, asking in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Folks, can I just again say to you, I bought a Baptist church, put in a search engine. You'll find out all about us. If you need contact, my details are there. The details of our other leaders, we have literature, we'd love to help you. So please do be in touch. And may God give you grace. May you live this week with great wisdom as you honor him. God wants to bless you and God wants you to honor him in all things. So have a great week. Beware of our enemy. He's out. He wants to sink us. Don't listen to his lies. But just surrender to the truth of God's word. And follow him. Have a great week. I trust it'll be a great week for you and that God would abundantly bless you.